Brett Thompson. Uh, Brett is a CEO of Right Africa and co-founder of the Credence Institute, an organization that advanced the interest of animals through market-based solution. In this presentation, we, we will learn if the future activists should, instead of protesting, promote how to go vegan, instead of why to go vegan, and offering solution in the form of clean and plant-based meat. So, Brett, if you are ready, yeah, you can start. Mary, can, can you hear me loud and clear? Just do a mic check. One yes. Minute. Yes. Yes. Oh, perfect. Thanks. Thanks very much for the introduction, and thanks to everybody for joining. Um, hopefully, not too many of you jump off and were like, "Oh no!" As soon as I start talking, let me do room B or room A. But uh, I'm sure I can keep you entertained for for the next. Uh, I think I've got about 30, 40 minutes, and then some Q and A. So that's the plan for it. So a little bit of background to um, sort of the motivation for this talk, and also the motivation for the organisation that I've co-founded. Um, I'm, if you think I've got a funny accent, I do. I'm from Cape Town, South Africa, um, which is down south from where I'm assuming most of where you guys are from. Um, and I've been involved in animal advocacy and plant-based food promotion for about 10 years or so now. And I've always sort of noticed that predominant animal advocate folks often seem, seem to tend towards more government interventions for solving the, the problems that we face when it comes to the interests of animals. Uh, and also particularly even when we do focus on corporate campaigning um, is generally looking at regulation over, over, over innovation for changing things. So taxation of, over removing subsidization is something as an example that I would probably give. So anyway, that's a bit of background to, to us. We're a very new organization, Credence. We are um, not even six months old and actually currently involved in the um, charity entrepreneurship incubator program. So we are um, but an embryo. Anyway, so I thought I'd just give you a little bit of an introduction to who I am as well, just to help things out. Um, and sorry, apologies if just for the shirtless selfie, but that's the only picture that I have from when I was younger, uh, when I was, um, you know, eating at a barbecue. Um, there is actually me with, or in South Africa, we call it a braai. And I was the braai guy or a barbecue guy and cooking um, lots and lots of meat for lots and lots of people. Um, I then went to uh, university and obviously when one goes to university, you change things up a bit and uh, stopped eating meat. And when you stop eating meat, you grow your hair long, you wear camo t-shirts and you wear headbands and, uh, and joined a band, obviously. obviously. Um, but uh, I had a way of sort of talking about it and I think it highlighted by this, um, this uh, uh, Facebook uh, post that I got un unfortunately reminded of uh, a, couple, a year ago. Um, and I won't read it to you, um, the whole thing, but it's basically just saying, uh, it's it's uh, something uh, it's talking about leather and meat rather um, and it belongs on a cow and nowhere nowhere else and um, you can see I got about three likes and uh, I don't know if that was the most effective use of my social media content but uh, that was sort of the way that I approached things back in the day um, these days I take a different tact um, I've uh, I've sort of found out that the ways to get a message across is probably finding people meeting people where they're at and I think the biggest reasons why that sort of ch change happened was that I started working for a company um, in South Africa that sells plant-based foods uh, about eight years ago um, called Fry's, Fry's Family Foods. And uh, when your salary is determined on people buying your food, uh, on, on believing your message rather, um, when you're marketing to them, um, it's, uh, it's a lot, you start looking at your approach a lot more attentively or attentively. Uh, and I found sort of telling people to, to go vegan or vegetarian wasn't helping. Um, and what is much more easier is just to get them to eat a, a nugget that is tastes like chicken, but it's not chicken. And the conversation afterwards is completely different. So that's, I think, was pretty much part of my metaphor, metamorphosis, if, it would, if you can say that. So I did this talk about a year ago for the first time um, in my hometown. And um, I was just doing some Googling. Um, and when I Googled KFC chicken, all the entries that I got in the news section were all just talking about the vegan uh, options that were being uh, being raised um, at, at KFC. Um, I think this is uh, this is uh, talking about the US and uh, also talking about a few other. Uh, uh, this is all about Beyond Meat that was happening at there at that stage. Um, and I thought when I when I actually did this presentation, that was this is the only slide I used, and I just said, look, um, is it basically uh, this is on the 31st of August 2019, and I, I asked the question then, um, which I'm going to pose to you guys now is. Is the job done? I mean, are we done already? If KFC is already taking such a hard line, I guess you could, not, hard line is a strong word, but um, is taking such a line with vegan offerings, are we already getting ourselves unemployed in the next couple of years? Um, but 
what I've been amazed since I did this talk a year ago and, and to, since and today, when I, no, I didn't do my preparation today, I promise I, I, I was about a week ago when I prepped for this again, um, was then I went and spent some time looking at what has happened with KFC over the past year. And uh, you can, you know, KFC, uh, again, is not a, a stellar business example that I would like to always use, but it just was, I just was blown away by what has happened since the 31st of August of last year. So the tracker starts on the 31st. It's just, it's, it's a random set in time. You could go back further. You could find more um, dates that uh, KFC has been like looking at um, vegan offerings and vegetarian offerings. Um, but that's the when I do the Google, so that's why it's there. Um, about a, a couple of months later with the beginning of Veganuary, um, they started the, they launched the, the chicken, vegan chicken burger um, with, the, with the help um, from the team of Veganuary. And I know they did a lot of work with um, with the folks from KFC in the UK. Um, in about a month, they sold a million burgers in the UK and Ireland, which was um, just uh, quite, a, quite, a, quite an achievement. Um, and then a couple of months later, um, the, the Beyond Fried Chicken was tested in the US. Um, and then in March of this year, uh, Rotterdam was, had their KFC go vegetarian, one of their, one of their KFCs go vegetarian for a week. Um, and then, you know, shortly thereafter, China wanted to get involved with it. And as you know, there's no talk about capitalism without mentioning China, I think. Um, and they started selling their first ever plant-based fried chicken. And when China does something, um, I guess, I don't know if Hong Kong has to, um, but uh, Hong Kong then launched their own menu called the New Era, which I, I thought, I wrote down my notes, don't make any jokes about um, UK following China into a new era, um, even though I just did. Um, and uh, they also started launching their own um, their own vegan range, and then finally um, Russia uh, subsequently followed. So I mean, this is just sort of within a, not even a year. Like, what's it today? It's just less than a year. We've seen this widespread change. When about a, like in the thirty first of August, I was just excited to see that there was Google um, results showing that uh, when you Google KFC chicken, you actually get vegan results. Not everybody's pretty happy about it. There's this funny viral video that went around with a, a UK woman who lost it with her boyfriend because she um, was fooled into eating a vegan burger, but you can't please them all. So anyway, what are we gonna be talking? So I guess, um, yeah, not everyone's happy with the, with the burgers, but um, what are we gonna be talking about it today um, is you know unconscious capitalism, how the market offers a shortcut to liberation, animal liberation, should I say. Uh, and, not even a couple of days ago, um, I subscribed to uh, the Open Philanthropy Animal Welfare Newsletter, uh, which is written by Lewis Bollard. Uh, I, I really encourage you to subscribe as well if you can. Um, and, you know, I got this email in my inbox and I was quite perturbed because if, if any of you read this in those couple of days, um, you might basically know more than, um, than me at the moment. But um, anyway, the, what I'm essentially going to be making the case is for the fact that the most important thing that we can do is... Um, as Lewis is saying here, is lower the, plant, uh, the price of plant-based meat. That's, um, that's where we need to be focusing our efforts, um, or maybe more uh, than there is at the moment. Um, yeah, I've got a link to this down below um, if, I'll, if you want to see the share, or I'll share the slides, but, or you can, um, I've, I've got his email address there um, if you want to email him yourself, but then we block it up again. But you can find this uh, on, their, on their website. Um, we've also just wrote an article on democratic socialism, um, looking at it from a more theoretical problem, uh, a position rather than problem, um, whether or not that is a good way to achieve um, salvation for animals. And you can find that on our blog um, if you are interested. Anyway, let me just quickly get to the presentation now. So I'm going to be talking about capitalism um, and just to make a definition, um, according to the Oxford definition, uh, an economic and political system in which a country's trade and industry are controlled by private owners for profit rather than the state. So I'm just, I'm working off that, um, that, that definition. Uh, conscious, I'm not talking about conscious capitalism, which I think a lot of people um, are, um, when they think about change within a system um, that we have at the moment, this mixed economy that we have, uh, uh, is, it's not conscious capitalism. Um, and um, well, I've got a definition here for conscious capitalism, a philosophy stating that businesses should serve all principles, uh, all stakeholders rather, including the environment. And then by, I guess, extension animals in our case. Um, and I'm saying, no, we can actually achieve this animal liberation without businesses doing this for ethical reasons or um, other reasons, pure, uh, other reasons outside of profit, which rather 
only profit maximizing reasons. So anyway, that's not what I'm talking about. So what I'm talking about is unconscious capitalism. And when I tried to Google it, there wasn't a term that had been coined. So I guess I'm coining the term. Um, however, it's essentially pretty much good old free market, uh, the, the free market. And when I refer to the market, um, uh, I'm, ref I'm referring to the market for vegan and plant-based foods and, and cultivated meat, um, uh, as sort of disrupting the existing way that we get protein. And, and when I talk about a shortcut, um, and what, I, what my, main, my main point is, is that we are able to um, sort of achieve good by bypassing the changes in attitudes in behaviors um, instead of asking for attitudes to change. So it's roughly saying, if we focus more attention on behavior opposed to attitude, we can still get the same sort of results potentially faster. Uh, An animal liberation, I'm just using that as a term to describe it. If we had to stop eating animals, we would have achieved um, animal liberation, in my, in my view, because of the most amount of suffering that we do today uh, to animals because of um, the animals that we eat. And just a disclaimer, um, capitalism is, is, just as a quote, capitalism is the worst economic system, except for all others. Uh, I'm not here to defend capitalism. Um, I wouldn't do a good enough job at it. I stopped studying economics 10 years ago. Um, I'm not the biggest proponent of it either. I'm just saying it is what we have and it's better than probably the alternatives. Uh, just interesting enough, this quote is often um, attributed to Churchill, Winston Churchill, but he was actually talking about democracy and not, um, and not capitalism. But anyway, just a little bit of uh, background information. Okay, so that's kind of some definitions out of the way. Um, I thought um, I thought it would be important just so that we were all on the same page. And uh, I want to kind of give you a little bit of anecdote from um, uh, from my hometown. Um, this is a, a picture that I took. Uh, I wasn't driving at the time. I had stopped just um, in case you thought I was texting and driving. Um, I had stopped and um, I had taken this picture. Um, and this is a uh, this is Bellevue Road, which is just literally down the road from where I live um, in Cape Town. Um, and this is the bottom of a of, of a hill, which happens to be one of the steepest hills in uh, in Southern Africa. Um, if not the Southern Hemisphere. The steepest hill is actually in New Zealand, if you wanted some useless information. But anyway, this is at the bottom of a hill on a, on a busy day uh, with a bit of traffic and I was heading home. Um, on the left, you'll see a stop sign that says stop. And then some would be folk has written driving, um, which you know I thought maybe was a bit more ironic or tongue in cheek. But upon closer reflection or um, zooming in rather, it says actually stop driving. You might not be able to see, but it says ride a bike. Okay. So this is the steepest hill probably in South Africa, uh, uh, or road, road rather, in South Africa. And um, I'm assuming um, uh, some would be bike enthusiastic, potentially eco-enthusiastic, eco has said uh, what you need to do is stop driving and rather ride a bike. Um, and they've decided to use that message at the, at the bottom of the steepest hill. And I thought that was quite a good analogy for what we are doing as animal advocates, so activists, vegans, etc. Um, uh, with our message for talking about veganism um, and promoting, um, promoting animal rights or animal interests as opposed uh, to the general population. I think a lot of us see ourselves probably at the top of the hill, not in a way of being superior, but more in a way of like we've achieved it, we've got there, we've gotten to the top. Um, we were able to eat a completely plant-based diet. It's pretty much easy for us, easy going. We can keep riding the bicycle um, and others, are, um, others just need to do it. And, I can just imagine that, um, you can just imagine if we actually had to stop a whole bunch of people who were trying to go to this road and give them a bike and say, choose the bike over, over the car, not many would do it. Um, and I think when we, make, when we go to somebody eating a, like a steak or a fillet steak or ribs or something and say, stop eating that, eat a veggie burger, it's, it's, the, equivalent, um, it's the equivalent message. And it's just not gonna result in behavior change. No matter how much we, we would want people to do that, from an attitude shift. So I want to give a case study uh, on, funny enough, a private company doing this type of uh, messaging and seeing whether or not it worked. And we work uh, for a host of reasons, hasn't worked on many things because there are, I think there are still a few of them going, but um, their market cap or market share has decre decreased quite a bit um, since uh, the, uh, over the past year or so, which I don't think has got anything to do with the, um, the fact that um, they told their, their, their um, staff and, and uh, 
and they, that they told their staff that they're no longer to have allowed to have meat on the premises or expense meat on their on the company card. Um, but decisions like this probably played a bit of a part. So I'm giving it a, this in a bit of a um, a breakdown in a few stories uh, in, a, in a few news uh, news items, news articles rather. Um, all from magazines that would probably be quite, um, ma magazines and publications that would be quite um, uh, in favor of sort of taking measures against things such as climate change um, through, um, you know, uh, you know, Slate magazine would be okay if we work at said something like rather encourage people to ride to work opposed to not eating meat or something along those lines. Um, but instead they called it tyrannical. Um, when uh, the New York Times reported on it, um, they saw they said that uh, it's we work is no longer a safe space uh, for carnivals so carnivals became victimized in this by the largest one of the largest publications on the on the planet um which is again not not something that you want to be on the other side of um as a as a group or organization or a company trying to promote a good cause such as um the interests of animals and then uh yeah and it was in um, when they spoke about their leader and they told him about, he was a bit of a cult uh, the cult of the founder. Um, they referenced this uh, fact that he just said that people needed to um, not eat meat anymore and part of the, on the rise up. So it didn't gain any popularity and not quite quickly um, they backtracked and decided to take this, um, to move away from this um, policy. Uh, and uh, if you were looking at the dates, uh, this all happened within um, less than a year. So it was, a, it was an intervention that was taken by um, the corporate uh, WeWork and didn't even take a, uh, it didn't even last a year. So I think when these interventions that we do, when it's done on um, uh, focusing on an attitude and then telling people by force, essentially don't do something, it doesn't work. Now, as, a, as, 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 as people involved in animal advocacy, I, this is something that we have been doing for years. Um, we've been speaking about, the, um, you know, trying to highlight the suffering that animals go through to the general public. For, for for as long as it's I think whenever the, whenever the vegetarian society or whatnot is a reference point, um, and I don't know we've, if we've been that successful in achieving that. If you look at the numbers game, um, you know around the world it's only a couple of percent of people that would say that they're vegan or vegetarian. I found this quite interesting because this was the 1944 um, publication of the Vegan News, and um, they at that stage um, were quite. Um, they were also making quite a strong case against vegetarians who they thought would be hypocritical. Um, if you read the article, it's quite interesting how they, even, at, even back in the day, vegans and vegetarians were saying we were having a bit of a gripe against each other. Um, anyway, they were focusing again mostly on moral reasons and um, we've been doing it for too long. I don't think we've had enough change. One interesting um, little bit that I wouldn't like to highlight your attention to is how they called the, the food industry the, the involved in the production of animal products is the flesh food industry, which uh, I thought that was quite witty and funny. But anyway, uh, in spite of that, the majority of people that do go, um, um, the study is probably a bit outdated now, but um, I'm sure you can, you can probably update it with some new information. But the majority of people don't hang around um, and stay vegan or vegetarian and they go back. So my suggestion is that I think that we focus too much. Um, and again, this is literally my, my, my thoughts. If you look at the source below, it's my thumb. I'm just, I'm, I'm sucking this, this figure out of, my, out of my thumb, is that I think we focused too much on the why and not enough on the how. And we don't give enough information about, to people about how they can make this change and how they can make this sustainable. Uh, and the numbers kind of back it up because we've got, we're essentially up against a thousand billion uh, dollar industry, um, which is represented by this giant gray ball on the, on the left hand side. And in that is a little dot that um, I've highlighted is the value of a billion but it's actually essentially the, um, the amount that the US farmed animal uh, organizations get. They get about 57, this is, might not be too up to date, um, but this is just looking at the US farmed animal outreach. So again, we're, we've got 57 million, uh, well in America, we've got 57 up against this massive industry. Um, and yes, a lot of them are working in corporate campaigning, um, but also still a significant amount are focusing quite a, quite a lot on the, on the why opposed to the how. And anyway, 57 million, up against a thousand, even if, um, you know, how I'm saying 90% should be spoke, spoken, uh, speaking about how we get there, um, it's still like, it's, a, it, it's dwarfed by the amount of money that is in this industry. Um, when I, you know, just as a reference point, um, if you are looking from the Animal Farm, fam, uh, Annual Farm Animal Advocacy, um, this is an article written by, again, by Lewis Bollard, 
predominantly um, um, North America, European focus, um, the sort of uh, global south or developing countries are, are not really receiving much in terms of funding. So I think particularly like, I think the argument in Africa is that for us to go and uh, try and take, um, uh, we've got to take a few more new, um, nuanced positions to try and um, increase the, the, uh, the reach of animal advocacy in Africa um, because we're starting from such a low, low base. Anyway, I think the question then comes down to how do we disrupt that thousand billion? I think that that's, that should be spoken about a lot more than how do we, um, how do we get people to um, get, uh, how do we get people to uh, go vegan or the equivalent? And um, this is now, as I've said, 2020, um, uh, still my thumb, I'm suggesting that we focus more on the how of over the why. And I'm making the case today that private companies are probably a bit more set um, and, and uh, they've got more funds available to tackle this problem when, even if it's not for the reasons that we would like to do. So, um, you know, Beyond Meat is definitely the founders who started the company with the, uh, the focus on doing good in the world um, to, end, uh, to, to end and reduce animal suffering. But now they've, they've got shareholders from all over. They, they, they have to report to their stakeholders and or not shareholders rather. Um, they are now a profit maximizing company. Um, and I think this is highlighted by something uh, which this is a, an article from, from June of this year where they've started the production of um, um, Beyond Meat Burgers in a, in a, in a, in a meat company or in a, in a factory of a meat company. Um, and I, I wonder, you know, from my experience of being involved in, um, well, I am still involved in um, selling, selling of plant-based food, um, plant-based proteins and whatnot, what kind of reaction that they would be getting? Because I know if we had to do something similar, we would get a lot of pushback for doing something like this. And I'm curious if there any, if, if any, even the Q&A of people, what people's th thoughts are of a meat company essentially um, taking on a, 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 the, a, the beloved Beyond Burger and um, making it and selling it. Um, just as a sort of side, um, I, I think that even within the plant-based space that they're not always getting it right. So if you look at the, this is the recent uh, report by GFI, um, they're actually missing quite a big opportunity with the lack of um, uh, production in plant-based um, uh, fish and uh, seafood. Uh, when you look at this animal-based meat, there is a significant amount um, uh, that is attributable to, or you know, is, is produced at shellfish and fish. Um, and that isn't being done in the plant-based space. So there's, you know, they, they don't get it right all the time. And uh, however, the, the, the interesting thing, the thing I wanted to make quick note on this is that cell, cellular agriculture um, seems to be a bit of a step ahead of the game in terms of seeing the need to get involved in, um, to get involved in the production of uh, cellular-based fish. And last year, they actually, the largest um, investment in cell-based meat was to Blue Nalu at $20 million. Um, and they, you know, they're going to be producing fish-based products. So that's quite interesting that they have taken that tax. Uh, again, there is opportunities. This is Kuliana, who uh, who are looking to be involved in the uh, in, in the sale of plant-based seafood. But I want to make a quick note on this article, which I found quite interesting, and it's a framing that I think a lot of people have is that, particularly in the plant-based space, is that they see that the the market that they're going after is the plant-based market. So this is beyond meat of sushi hooks onto 13.7 billion plant-based market in general. Whereas I don't necessarily think that's the right attitude to be taking. I know this is written by a, a journalist, but I think a lot of people hold this belief that what we need to go in is sort of grow the plant-based space and get involved there. But essentially what we're trying to do is compete for space from the meat, animal-based meat proteins. Uh, and that's just a slight nuance that I think people, if people could take one to see the competition as the, the wider meat uh, industry opposed to just the, um, the plant-based space, then I think that from a producer side, I think it would broaden the horizons and focus on the fact that um, your customer base, is, your average customer consumer base um, doesn't necessarily care as much as what we think on issues, whether it's um, climate change, uh, palm oil, et cetera. They kind of just, they, they don't have the ability or the luxury to make those decisions. They're trying to sort of buy whatever they can at the cheapest price point um, possible. Um, excuse me. So when, uh, when even focusing on the how, I, I always find that we also, we hold the organized, the companies rather that are 
making it possible for so many people to eat more plant-based foods and uh, we're making their lives a little bit more difficult. I've worked and I've sold uh, veggie burgers for 10 years at, 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 at on and off for fries. And um, I know that the hardest customer was never, um, was never a meat eater. It was always a vegan or vegetarian uh, to uh, hard, the hardest customer to the, the feedback that we would get. And I'm not, this is not a sob story. Um, there's a lot of companies that got a lot of money then they deserve some feedback and some um, and pushback. But I think it's, uh, uh, it's, it's just always interesting to note that um, the, these companies that kind of try and aspire to do good are the ones that lift, um, show, show, the, show the sort of hole in the armor and are attacked predominantly by folks uh, who should be supporting them. So I wanted to quickly give a case study on Oakley. Um, and uh, Oatly, uh, who uh, based out of Sweden, but have now expanded quite rapidly to the rest of the world, uh, a couple of, I think this is about a year ago, uh, 2019, uh, they took on investment from Oprah Winfrey, which, I mean, there's nothing that's awesome. Can't really say anything about that. Jay-Z, you know, again, fantastic, pretty cool. But then they also took on investment from a company called Blackstone. And I don't know if anyone's familiar with this case. Uh, it's quite, I, I found it interesting because I heard it from a local a radio station here in Cape Town. So that's how far the news spread about this, about this um, plant-based milk company um, selling out to um, someone like Blackstone. And if you don't know Blackstone, uh, this is just quickly what, um, uh, you know, this is just a, 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 a section of an, an article written about them is that um, they've sort of been known and uh, criticized for their stake in, um, I'm not going to try and, uh, I'm not going to try and pronounce this, um, in, in being involved in deforestation in the rainforest. Um, they've also been accused of supporting Trump. So obviously that's just, you know, you can't ever do that as a company and, um, and then try to get involved in an eco-friendly brand. Um, they've got a, quite a bad rep um, f across the world, to be honest. Um, and then that kind of, the fact that Oatly then took the money um, and sold out resulted in quite a lot of negative feedback, um, which you can see, I think this uh, Liana, um, I think she's actually from the UN, uh, something involved in the sustainability part of that. I don't know, uh, uh, don't quote me on that. Um, um, Oatly is selling out their soul. Uh, and then I think my favorite one was a blog piece uh, written by, I think, quite a fan. Uh, oh, she was quite a fan, um, saying that uh, their new flavors include greed and blood. Now, this is the kind of, uh, you know, this is the kind of attitude that I've, um, I've noticed that a lot of people do have um, when it comes to corporates, and it's completely within your right to critique. Um, but I do wonder the sort of um, effectiveness of that. Uh, and the $200 million, like I thought, you know, if, as a thought ex experiment, what if uh, Oatly didn't take the $200 million that was offered to them by the likes of Blackstone? Well, what would have happened, for, may, what might have happened um, is that those, those $200 million, would have, uh, they, would have, they would have got it from somebody else because Oatly is um, a, a massive brand. And they probably would have got it from um, investors that were probably more focused on sustainable in the first place. So they would have already bought into the message that um, you know, they wanted to get involved in Oatly. Blackstone might have now decided, okay, I'm not gonna actually get involved in this anymore. We, we will continue with our destroying of the, the, the rainforest in Brazil. Um, and at the same time that Oatly would have then taken a lot of sustainable um, funding available, that was available to maybe other companies, Oatly has now taken that on because they're the bigger brand. And smaller companies who would want to sell a plant-based option might not get might not get it. So, you know, it's, it could, if, if yes, Oatly may have taken something that affected their brand, um, but it, it might have been the thing that has actually benefited more animals than we know. If they're getting a company like Blackstone, who might not pivot and move away from being evil <laughs> to wanting to do, uh, to do good, even if it was done for um, the wrong reasons. So just quickly, I, I wanted to quickly highlight this, um, you know, if you, some people say a plant-based industry is just gonna become another evil enterprise and, uh, and that's uh, if we can't really see them expand because then they'll sell out. Uh, the facts seem to be um, representing a slightly different case when just if you look at it from an average income, um, it's about 12 and a half thousand more in the US compared to the national average, um, which is, you know, there's obviously a lot more stats that we need to like look into it, but there's something to be said that they're not a bunch of money grabbing monopolists and maybe um, they are uh, a little bit better than we hope. 
So are they Scrooge McDucks? You know, they're charging high, high prices. A Beyond Burger is a lot more expensive than any, anything else. Um, I think that's also a good thing. High prices are a price signal to the market. Um, that showcases to other producers that there's money to be made here. And we've seen that like what Impossible and, um, and Beyond have done has resulted in the likes of Nestle um, and even Unilever buying into a plant-based producer. Uh, of rates of, of lead. So price, these high prices is maybe not great for you and me who want to go and buy uh, a veggie burger, but it does bring new, mark, uh, new, new folks into the market. So uh, I, I, I guess, I guess the, the, the question is that, are we looking, um, uh, is it, uh, okay, shaking the visible hand, is it about kind of getting involved and um, ensuring that in, intervening with these corporates and making sure uh, that they do what we say um, through pressure campaigns and and the like. Um, well, I like this quote because um, it kind of, it speaks to both. I think it says that, um, well, let me just read it out. There is nothing more powerless than a corporation. And uh, it's essentially saying that because the, the corporation just has to do whatever the, the consumers say uh, and not the other way around, which I'm sure a lot of people might have a disagreement on that. Um, but even if you don't take on, if you don't consider that, uh, I think that organizations are starting to tremble um, and seeing the change in the market. Uh, and this isn't the, um, the most accurate representation of this, but it's something that I like to look at it. In 2016, when I first uh, started checking, looking into FAIR, um, I'm sure uh, hopefully some of you know, but FAIR is the, oh, I've gone blank on it, but FAIR, uh, initiates, initi the FAIR initiative facilitates collaborative investor engagements with companies on key issues linked to invest in intensive animal production. Um, apologies if uh, you, you, you actually are, unf are unfamiliar with it, but I do encourage you to have a look at them. Um, so it's starting to like increase or see what type of membership, no, well, their membership is growing because a lot of the investors in the ESG world are seeing the need to switch um, towards uh, more sustainable proteins in the supply chain. Um, and in 2016, when I first started checking them out, um, their, mon their members fund funds under management was 1.3 trillion, which is just an unreal amount of money, uh, pension funds and the like, um, and the bigger and bigger ones like that. Um, and August 31st last year was 17.1, October 5th, 19.3 trillion, um, and uh, 12th of August when I googled this, uh, 23 trillion. So there seems to be something happening is what is the point I'm trying to make with this, um, and it's something that I think we should be encouraged by and um, excited by and not see it as um, something that's uh, uh, as, as a negative when there's a lot of money trying to get behind uh, moving away from factory farming, um, even within the corporate space. So just looking back at the numbers, this is the plant-based market uh, about a year ago, 4.63 billion. And not to say that that's massive compared to the thousand, but it's starting to shape up. And then, when it comes down to the actual, um, the meat of it, uh, I think this is where not enough attention is paid. And it kind of goes back to what I said in the beginning, when um, the, uh, with, with the fact that um, plant-based protein, when, when you speak to somebody about eating more plant-based protein and they're eating a steak and you offer them a veggie burger, it's just definitely not, cannot be seen as a substitute good. Uh, I think now we're starting to see that within the burger space, which is the ground beef, which is obviously easier to make from a plant-based uh, perspective, it is starting to be more comparable in its looks, texture, taste, etc. cetera. Um, and, and more and more um, flexitarians, meat producers are looking to start to eat it, to start to eat it. However, um, this is highlighted um, in the article by Lewis Bollard, uh, is that it's clearly still at the price point, which is a significant issue. And that's sort of the, that, that article that um, I really do encourage you to read. Uh, and the fact that the cheapest, um, uh, the, you know, what is it? The cheapest uh, ground uh, beefless beef is still more expensive um, than, a, than a equivalent in the beef burger range, oh, and even in the, in the same market. Uh, the reason why a lot of retailers are still, well, one of the reasons why rather, um, is that uh, retailers are still happy to include, include um, uh, the uh, plant-based versions in the in the in the category, um, even when they have such a lower meat sales, like the volume is a lot lower, um, is because um, this is actually just quite interesting. It's 
4.5% uh, of the US supermarkets in the, in, in the refrigerated meat product lines are now plant-based. So that's quite exciting. Um, but plant-based meat only accounts for 0.3 to 4% of meat, sale, meat, uh, meat sales by volume. But the reason why cons uh, the retailers are ha happy to have it in their aisles is because they have a higher rate of sale. Um, they are selling more and, sorry, Robin, not, not higher rate of sale, sorry, but they have a higher price point. So it's, we, it's this kind of a, a sticky situation is that we at the same time have to start increasing the sales volume as well as reduce price, which you kind of assume would happen regardless. But the product needs to be delicious and, and, and it needs to be an, seen as an equivalent um, alternative to the existing one, which it, at the moment isn't. So how do we lower this price? Um, and I, um, I think uh, there's a couple of interesting, um, there's a couple of interesting reasons of how, of how to do it. Um, one could look at one of the suggestions uh, is uh, going back to more frozen products because it's got you know, better shelf life. You can, you, can, uh, you can mass produce it easier because of that and store it better and sell it at a cheaper rate and get on volumes. But uh, I think the perception around um, a lot of people in, um, who are uh, current uh, um, meat eaters is that uh, the eating of plant-based is seen as a lower, uh, a lower product than what their equivalent is. So that's probably not the, the, right, um, the right solution. Um, scale and sim simplicity is something I'm, I'm actually just quoting here from Lewis Bollard again. Uh, scale and simplicity is, is, is an option as well, um, which kind of speaks again to uh, the getting more into the frozen now. Um, and as well as cheap, cheap inputs and cheap outputs. So it's always, it's, it's focusing on, uh, the, the case uh, being major is to focus a lot on getting um, uh, mass produced food out there at, to as many people as possible. And I think that's good enough for like the lower, the, the, when, if we're looking at the burgers and the sausages and then whatnot, where people are happy to kind of um, switch between the two. But when it comes to sort of the higher end things, which I think builds the perception of how people view um, plant-based foods, we can't actually compromise on and make sure things are just cheap and, 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 and nasty and getting them out there. Um, and I, I think the, the key component that has been left out um, in this discussion often um, is innovation. Uh, and innovation uh, is only going to driven by the driven by people like this. Um, um, Mayoko, Mayoko is the, uh, if I'm getting it right, is the pl uh, plant-based cheeses and, and dairy products. Um, and the man on the right is, um, Pat Brown from Impossible Foods, and um, they are producing a high-end product that is really starting to compete at the point with other with meat products. And uh, I think this one, this this quote from Pat Brown kind of sums it up really nicely for me: is that um, the cow is kind of stagnated, and we're getting better at it every single day. Um, they being Impossible Foods. So, uh, I, the, I think the true cost of um, uh, the true cost of compassion is kind of what we, as people involved in animal advocacy, and, and it's to say, vegans and vegetarians have to go through on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, this picture on the right here is a pretty innocuous picture, but what it's trying to say, I don't know if you can make it, if you can notice it, but the one on the right um, is a cappuccino that a friend of mine had, and the one on the left is one, or the low, low half of the picture is mine. You might not be able to tell the difference, but uh, the one has a heart in it and the other doesn't. <laughs> and uh, the one that happens to be with vegan milk is the one that doesn't have a heart. And I know that's silly, but it's just so many of these types of things that uh, these costs that we have to sort of endure in spite of, the, in spite of the fact that and I had to pay more for it, that when people see that, they say, well, that's re another reason why I can never go plant-based because every part of my life is kind of slightly compromised. So until, until those like those small, tiny little bits in your life, in, in somebody's life can, aren't being affected by moving um, towards a plant-based diet have changed. I don't think we're necessarily gonna achieve what we're wanting to do, wanting to achieve. And um, so what I'm saying here is that the, we, we will only achieve an unconscious shift uh, towards animal liberation. So without people having to kind of do, we don't have to do anything anymore as, as activists and advocates, it's gonna be done before us. When compassion becomes competitive, so the compassion, the price point of compassion just needs to become better without, uh, before, um, before we can see the lasting change that I think um, we all are looking for. And um, I kind of wanted to skip forward a few bits because we've only got a few minutes left before I wanted to do some Q&A. 
Um, but it's done through things like this. Uh, on the left is the um, is a company called the Better Meat Company, which uh, is combining animal and plant-based proteins together. Um, you know, the discussion about getting impossible food and like products into the meat aisle, opposed to being in their own section. And then what we're going to see is that when you start combining these all together with plant-based global farmed animal outreach, VC in the clean, clean meat space, it starts seeing a little bit more of an equal fight. Um, and I think that's where we're going towards. Um, but again, uh, there's just this slight nuance on, this, on the shift that I would, I'm, I'm suggesting uh, that we move into more on the, on the how and not the why. Um, and then we'll probably uh, reach that peak meet, hopefully in 2025. And this is an interesting report that I suggest you read from A.T. Kearney. Um, and then just in closing, I'm, I'm, I, I'm, I took this picture. Well, actually, I didn't take this picture. I actually found this picture. But I've seen this picture a few, a few times uh, when I was living in Berlin, um, where some would-be activist or advocate uh, had said uh, on the Stop Street, they had written, stop eating animals. And um, again, I think this is where we're at at the moment still. We're still just telling people, stop eating animals, eat something that's probably perceived as not as good. And um, this is going to change with the likes of the increased innovation um, through companies such as Impossible Foods and Beyond and, and Cultivated Meat and Clean Meat. Um, and backing those types of organized companies rather is something that I would suggest is a stronger, better use and effective use of your time. That then eventually, instead of saying, uh, stop eating meat, or rather stop eating animals, we'll say, stop eating animals, eat meat. Okay, thank you very much, Ariane. I kind of sh I rushed to the end there, but uh, you, you, you take some I'll take some questions. Thank you very much for interesting presentation. So, uh, just quick reminder, we have still maybe eight more minutes. So if you have any question, feel free to ask. You can use the Slido, uh, but make sure that you choose the room C. And we already have a few questions. So the first one is, which sector do you think needs more investment in technolo technology advancement, plant-based meat or cellular agriculture or both? Um, yeah, that's a that's a pretty that's an interesting question. I think um, if I had to, um, I think a cultivated meat is is this um, a very nascent industry. Um, uh, the if you look at the stats, um, it got 50 million, I think, two years ago in in VC funding, 50 million dollars, and then it got 90, um, I think, 90 million or 70 million. You rather you would have seen this year compared to uh, plant-based meat, which got 900 million. Um, 900 million dollars. So I think if you had to take a more long-termist view, um, I think the, the, I'm, I'm very bullish on clean meat. I think that's probably where we need to spend more of our attention. Um, and I think it, the, the interesting thing as well is within that, there's this discussion between like, where do you put the, in cultivated meat? Because chicken is obviously such a, such a massive, you know, everybody eats so much chicken. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's an obvious example, but, but Getting something like a, a, a proper uh, lab grown, I don't like to use the word lab grown, but a lab grown steak would probably have a far more in, a larger impact in the mindset of consumers and the public and the media and even government compared to um, maybe chicken breasts or something. So the answer would be, uh, I think the plant-based industry is not got enough. <laughs> uh, and I think the cultivated meat uh, industry needs its... Uh, uh, it needs its uh, it needs money, <laughs> and I'm not saying that because I started a cultivated meat company in South Africa. But anyway, biased. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, another quite interesting question is, what's your opinion on meat companies, including plant-based options, by buying such products? Aren't we ultimately adding money to meat uh, product producing companies? Yeah, so is, if, I, if, if, if someone wants to jump into the question, just so I know if I have it right, um, you're saying, um, what, what, are, what are my thoughts on like when, when a, a meat company um, adds, you know, like a McDonald's adding um, veggie, bur um, veggie burgers onto their menu? Is that maybe a... Yeah, or, 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 yeah. yeah probably this or just meat, uh, like manufacture of meat. Mm. Yeah, I think, I mean, I take quite a... Um, an extreme view here, which I don't think would be that is not necessarily that a popular one. Um, I would, I would encourage meat companies to, you know, 
in, in, encourage them to start in selling the idea that like 80-20, you know, buy an 80-20 burger and 80% beef, 20% mushroom, for example. Um, so not even to say like them promoting um, vegetarian burgers of their range, but rather to try and put this notion into like their consumer's mind that actually we can actually push, what we're pushing is the, the fact that you don't have to always eat 100% beef. You know, you can actually include other plant-based protein and that's a good idea. So I would even take it to an extension. So I think I, I'm seriously, um, I encourage when the likes of Burger King brings out an impossible burger. I ate way too many of those with David, who's on the call uh, when we were in the United States last year. Um, but then the, the, I don't, this issue of like separate grills, et cetera, I think that's blown out of proportion sometimes. And if we, if, if meat companies see this and like, oh, I'm never going to get involved in, um, uh, I'm never going to get involved in this industry because everybody complains no matter what I do. I think it's kind of sending the, 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 the wrong message. Um, I think you're in your rights to not want to eat from a company that sells a meat product. Um, but, you know, it's, it's, I, I think we should be encouraging that behavior. I hope that answers the question. Sorry. I think so. Yes. Thank you. Um, yeah. Another question. Maybe you already like answered it during the, the presentation, but um, the question is chickens, etc., uh, are PR stunt or legitimate progress? Oh, sorry. Can you repeat that? Yeah. Uh, I think that the question is that uh, like, uh, chicken nuggets, etc. If it's just uh, like if it's uh, we can count it as legitimate progress, or it's just some PR or just some okay. fantastic news. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can. Um, so the question is, so like for example, on the KFC example that I started with, um, is that like, can I am I over um, representing the success of us by the fact that KFC you know did a PR stunt? And I think it's a valid question, and I can assume. Um, the likes of KFC and stuff were trying to, I'm, again, I'm not making the case that they were doing it for the right reason. I'm assuming that they did it for a, pol a political st a policy stunt because now they can say they scored a couple of CI, uh, corporate social and sustainability uh, points or whatever. Um, so I, I think it's better to suggest that that's a, a more of a, it's just a marker. So I think if I had to go back 10 years ago when I first got involved in this stuff, well, I, I'll give you an example. Um, 10 years ago, if I recall correctly, um, we, pro we approached a chicken company in South Africa, and this is being recorded, so I won't say who, um, and we pitched our, and I'm talking we as Fry's, the company that has um, been involved with for a number of years, and we pitched our chicken products to them. And they literally said that this is too good for, we don't want to put it on our menu because people will be like, I, you know, if they eat a, a chicken nugget and then they go, which one's the vegan one, not know. Um, that it's like it's a bad for their brand the fact that now 10 years later it's a complete opposite even if it's for a pr stunt i think it's something that we should celebrate and suggest that there's progress it's not enough but it's definitely something and is it a volume i don't think so but when kfc sells a million burgers i can guarantee you that they're looking at that and saying okay we're making a quick return on this and we're able to charge higher prices sorry so they're seeing this as a as a as, 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 a, as a way to get an additional revenue stream that they hadn't got before. Um, and I know, just lastly, that, um, when um, Unilever, I don't know if this is exactly correct, but um, Matthew Glover from Veganery told me, I saw, he did a presentation on this, so I'm going to get it wrong. But he, um, he spoke of when Flora introduced their vegan margarine. And like, say what you want about margarine, it's fine. I don't like, so the other day I posted about margarine, and my mate was like, dude, you should use coconut oil. I'm like, I'm not talking, I'm not having coconut oil. Okay, I'm eating margarine. Anyway, um, they saw growth in the category, in their category on margarine for the first time in ages because they introduced a vegan margarine. So I think that's, that's the kind of, those types of things are the things that we should celebrate and suggest that it actually, the executives are starting to wake up and seeing that there's profit here. And then from our point of view, it's, it's, it's going to be um, promoting the, the causes that we, we are obviously passionate about. Time for last question, and also the last question. Uh, so thank you for your talk. Uh, we will be able to make the slides and video recording on the talk available. And this is probably the question if you like confirm that uh, the, this recorded could be uh, posted online. Um, well, now that I'm, I'm on, the, this is being recorded, so I have to say yes. Um, 
<laughs> yeah, but of course, yeah, I'm, I'm happy to do it. Um, yeah, just if you can edit all the ums out, I'll be pretty happy. But and then I'll share the I'll share the links as well uh, that I that uh, I did speak to. Um, I don't. I'm, I guess Mariano, I'll I'll, I'll rel relate with or liaise with you and the team on how to get that. Yes. Out yes. Afterwards, the m many of the presentation will be available online. Uh, I'm noted not all of them, but most of them will be available online. So if you uh, are fine with this, also this presentation will be available. Yeah. And then, uh, Mariano, if I'll just say, well, um, I know that there's like, it looks like some fantastic questions and stuff here. Um, I'll also be available on, on one of the networking, um, uh, one of the networking things. Um, so if you've got other questions, give me a shout. And then um, I'll chuck my email address. Please don't spam me um, here as well. If you've got uh, any additional, any hate mail is also fine. Uh, Queen's Institute. <laughs> okay, cool. Here we go. Okay. So your email is in the chat for everyone who has some further question, right? Just no, no hate mail or spam. <laughs> <laughs> don't don't okay. add it to your newsletter to get subscribers. <laughs> okay. So again, thank you very much for a really interesting uh, presentation.